Good morning, and welcome to your daily dose of your cup of cyber. Today our cup is from the Great Smoky Mountains of West Virginia. As always, Illy Coffee to start your day. Bright and sunny out here in uh, Virginia. Probably in the mid-20s or so. And uh, let's get going and talk about some cyber topics. Today we're going to talk about uh, a security control from NIST Special Publication 853, which is the control catalog. Um, a lot of you know that one. Um, just one second here. Uh, as the catalog that goes with the risk management framework um, or the cybersecurity framework. And both those are important. But the thing about the control catalog is it really doesn't have to be used with any framework at all. Um, it's just a set of controls um, that we can implement to secure any system. So today we're going to start with one of the, the basic controls. It's uh, AC1 or Access Control 1. It is actually um, tied to the Dash 1 family, what they call the Dash 1 family. And what that for 853. That doesn't mean it can only be used by the federal government. Um, it can be used really by anyone. It's freely available on the internet. You can download it and check it out. It's got a lot of good information in it. So we're going to jump down to AC1, um, Access Control Policies and Procedures. Uh, a little hard to see on this one. This is just a cut from the document itself. Um, you can see this is the family of Access Control. There's a lot of controls within the AC family. We'll cover, uh, I guess we'll cover all of them in the next, next few weeks. So we break down a little bit more. Um, the first part of the control is going to talk about what the organization has to do, uh, what you have to do to implement this control. How do you build uh, access control policies and procedures? So we, got to, we have to build both of those documents that outline the policies and the procedures for our organization when it comes to access control, you know, how do we issue access to the different systems that, that we have, even physical access to our organization. So the first part, part A, talks about writing the documents and, and getting out to people, right? Um, anywhere you see those square brackets, um, that's where you have to assign something as an organization. So either you assign it or your organization at a higher level is going to assign those variables. So what the, those are called organizationally defined variables. Normally they're assignments, but sometimes they can be selections. So in this case, uh, we have a few assignments that have to be made. The first one is who gets the document, who gets the uh, policies and procedures. So that's the first part of saying the organization develops documents and disseminates to, and, and what they need to know when you write this, this this control is who does the policy and procedure go to, right? So uh, the assignment is organizationally defined personnel or roles. So you could say, you know, everyone in the organization gets it or any person that has access to computer systems or networks, right? So it's up to you to determine who the policy and procedure goes to, but you have to document, it has to be documented somewhere, right? Um, and then we talk about it inside the, the documentation, right? There has to be an access control policy that addresses purpose, scope, roles, responsibilities, management commitment, coordination amongst organizational entities, compliance, and, and then part two, uh, procedures to facilitate the implementation of the access control policy and associated access controls. Um, that gets you through part A. So the first part is, you know, there's a lot of stuff and each of those pieces can lead you to fail this control if you're going through an assessment or an audit. So first part, you know, what's the purpose of the document? So you have to define the purpose of the document. Um, you know, th that could be simply as this document will um, define the, the policy around access control at Acme Corp. Um, the next part is the scope. How, how is it organization-wide? Is it business unit-wide? Is it just a geographical location? Um, so maybe it's organizationally-wide. Um, then those roles and responsibilities, those could be kind of tied together. You know, 
the CSO is going to be responsible for something. Um, you know, your in information system security officers will be responsible for something. End users will be responsible for something. You have to define all those things. Um, like any policy, like anything in security, you need management commitment with this. Um, in a policy or a procedure, it's nice to get someone to sign off on it, uh, someone in leadership to sign off it on it. And then that kind of says you have management commitment, right? Um, the management has to back your policy. Um, they have to enforce the things you're trying to do uh, in your security program. Um, coordination among organizational entities, you know, it, it, it may be developed by the information security team, uh, but leaders in other parts of the organization need to back it, right? So um, how do we coordinate with those other entities? And is it a CSO doing that or is it somebody in the information security staff doing that? How, how is there org coordination among the, the entities? Um, and then how do we ensure compliance with this document? You know, is there any um, requirement that everyone reads it? Is there requirements that if you, you know, break the policy, something happens? So that all has to be documented in your policy. Um, and then the procedure facilitates the implementation. So that's the bit more details of how this uh, policy gets actually implemented. The procedures for implementing access control um, and all the controls around it. So when we talk about things like AC2 and 3 and 4, the things we're going to talk about later, those shall be wrapped in your procedures as well, right? Um, not to the fine grain detail, but at a high level. Um, and then there's got to be a review cycle, and that's what B talks about. How often do we review and update the policy and procedures, right? And again, those are organizationally defined frequencies. Um, so the policy is going to get defined. Again, the policy will be updated how often. You know, that's going to be up to your organization how often you want to update the policy. And then the procedures will be updated normally at a higher frequency. So if we look at things like FedRAMP or the way that cloud computing within the government works, uh, policies, I think, are updated about every three years, and procedures are updated every year to keep them more fresh, right? Um, let me get the right one up here. That one go away. There we go. Then there's always a section on supplemental guidance, right? So this one says the control ad addresses the establishment of policy and procedures for the effective implementation of selected security controls and enhancements in the AC family. So essentially this, this, this policy and procedure address all of the controls they're gonna follow, that will follow in the AC family. So there's a bunch of controls, I think there's 22 of them. Um, so this policy and procedure should address kind of all of those uh, at, at the documentation level. Um, policy and procedures reflect applicable federal laws, executive orders, directives, regulations, policy standards, and guidance. So we should wrap all that up into this policy and procedure as well. So not only the things in NIST guidance, but if there is a federal law or internal policy or regulation you have to follow, those should be wrapped up in here as well. So if you have to follow something like HIPAA or you have to follow something like PCI, get that in the same policy. Don't have different policies for those, right? Um, security pro program policies and procedures at the organization level may make the need for system-specific policies and procedures unnecessary. That's what we want. We don't want every system owner to have to develop this. We develop it at the organization level and everyone inherits it and that takes one control you know, off the, the plate of those people that are implementing this at the system level. They can just inherit it. And that's the big thing about the RMF. Um, we can do that, right? Um, the policy can be included as part of a general information security policy for organizations or can be represented in multiple policies reflecting the complex nature of organizations. All they're saying is there is you can take all the dash ones um, for every family and put them in one big security policy um, or you can have an AC policy and then an AT or awareness and training policy, um, you know, maintenance policy. You can have the, all these different policies or you can have one overarching big policy. That's up to you, right? Um, the procedures can be established for the security program in general and for particular information system if needed. That means if your system has some um, special thing that you need uh, a policy or procedure on, you can have your own policy or procedure at the system level. They're, they're saying you don't have to have just one overarching policy, but if that makes more sense, do it. But if you need specific guidance at the system level or at the organizational 
business unit level, like maybe, maybe finance has different access control rules than the rest of the organization, then finance will make their own access control policy, right? Um, the organization risk management strategy is a key factor in establishing policies and procedures. Of course, um, all everything today is related to risk management. So we want to take a risk focused approach on the way we build our policies and procedures. We don't, you know, write these archaic documents that people can't comply with. It has to be risk balanced. So we work with the risk teams and we, we get a policy and procedure that makes sense for our organization, right? Um, so then finally at the bottom, um, the bottom of the control, uh, we're gonna have an area for control enhancements. That's that's those parentheses. So maybe you've got uh, for AC2, we've got AC2 enhancement one. You'd see AC2 and then a parentheses, one and parentheses. And that would be uh, an additional enhancement that maybe is not required, um, but it can help strengthen that control, right? So. In this case, there are no enhancements. When we get to AC2 next week, um, you'll see a number of enhancements that can reinforce the control. Um, we have our references. So um, we have NIST Special Publication 812, which is an introduction to information security, and 800-100 um, Information Security Handbook for managers, really. Um, so those are your two references for this one. Um, and then finally, at the bottom, we have this priority and baseline allocation. The priority is that P1. That doesn't mean um, how critical it is, right? In the military for a long time, in the Department of Defense, we had these ratings, these category ratings, CAT 1, CAT 2, CAT 3. That's how critical it is for those controls to be implemented correctly. Um, these priorities are a little, di little different. The priorities mean which should be done first, right? So you want to develop your policies and procedures before you implement other controls. So essentially, if you see P1, you look at all your, maybe you're doing the access control family, implementing those controls. You do all the P1s first, then you do all the P2s because they pull things from the P1. So, you know, maybe, um, you know, you're going to have a, a, a requirement in a P2 control that P1 has to be in place first, right? And the same thing for P3. P3 are done after P2, and then anything left over um, will be done, like the P0s will be done. Uh, when you can get to them, right? So it's just a, a an order of doing things. It's not necessarily how critical that control is. Um, it just makes sense from a program standpoint. P1s first, P2 second, P3s, P3s third. Um, and then the last part about that is that baseline allocation. With this one's easy. Uh, this just tells us what profile this control applies to. So if we have a low profile, we'll do AC1. Moderate profile, we'll do AC1 and a high profile will do AC1. So any of the baselines uh, will do a, will implement AC1. So AC1 is required for all of the baselines, right? So again, next week when we had AC2, it's a little different because there'll be um, different enhancements required at different levels. So as you get into a more, um, a higher category system, like a high classification system, you're obviously going to get more controls than a low one. So that kind of wraps up where we're at. Um, hope you enjoyed the little quick quick talk this morning on AC1 and a kind of an overview of um, controls, at least 853 controls. Uh, and just remember, controls are safeguards. They're things put in place. They're countermeasures. Um, they're there to help protect the system. And a lot of times they just come from uh, common sense, right? And over time, we, we learn things like you have to have a policy for um, passwords. You have to put passwords in place. So that became a control, have passwords. Um, just like this, we need to have policies and procedures. That set the sets the framework for everything in that family, in this case, access control. Um, have a policy and procedure. That way people know what they're supposed to do. System owners know how to build systems. And users know what what's required of them, right? So um, if you like this, Join me in the morning, seven o'clock every morning. You know, it's early someplace, especially on the, the uh, West Coast out there. Uh, maybe we need a different time, but um, like and subscribe, hit the bell. You'll know when the new stuff's going out. Um, join us tomorrow at seven if, you, uh, if you're if you up and moving. Thanks for joining us on CyberEcon, Cup of Cyber. Talk to you later.